Talked a bunch of Ohio State, Penn State on the last pod. You want to hear that? We'll talk some more during Race for the Case. Wanted to get into this because it's a potential that could happen with Ohio State, Penn State. Uh, college football playoff had a little meeting. A webinar where they trying to educate us, trying to educate the media. Good luck, Rich Clark, new executive director. Not only are we hard to educate, but uh, we'll get it wrong anyway. And even if you educate every beat writer in the country, someone will say something on TV that's wildly <laughs> wrong. <laughs> that has a much bigger microphone. I always find that funny. Dan, it's uh, it's almost like you know how the media sausage is made. It's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Both teams have the color blue. They can't play in the quarterfinals. <laughs> I read that. Anyway, most of the stuff we kind of knew, there, there were just two things that he reiterated that I thought were, were pretty interesting. One is uh, rematches are going to happen. Um, I don't have – th- th- this is something that gets college – football fans very upset or I don't know about upset, but they get kind of fired up. I'd rather there weren't Uh, rather see more new teams play each other, but this is just how it's going to be with the two, two massive conferences in the big 10 and the sec. And then the other is um, he said, and this is going to, this has been something we've been talking about. What happens when do you want to go to the college, to your conference championship game and then lose? Or would you rather just not make it and come in third? And we have seen through the years teams get in because somebody lost a conference championship game. Ohio State did it to Penn State one year. Penn State actually, uh, they, uh, we saw it with USC losing a couple years ago. Ohio State got in different times. Uh, Clark's line, I don't think a team would be unduly penalized if they lost in a conference championship game. Uh, that uh, as an and now educated person, let me tell you that uh, I don't think is not a uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, what you think there, Ross? We we talked about it back in April. You know the the CFP met. I think I was there in Dallas, and we did we did our show from there. And one of the things um, discussed from there um, with the commissioners, you know, who control all this, was uh, rematches, and they decided in a twelve team playoff not to you know, not to implement any kind of policy to avoid rematches. If you go back, Dan, to the last 10 years and you applied the 12-team playoff and you also considered the realignment moves, there would have been seven first-round conference versus conference rematches. So you, 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 all but three years, you got at least one. Um, Now, again, a little... A little odd doing that while considering the conference realignment, you know. Uh, but there's no doubt that we'll we'll have some rematches, and there's a good chance that uh, in the in the first round we'll have one every other year or so, or, or maybe more. Um, I kind of think that they, you know, the NCAA tournament has a policy, obviously, that um, uh, it kind of has a protocol where they uh, avoid the first our first two rounds, right? Rematches in the first two rounds, I believe, and it or conference conference versus conference games in the first couple rounds. And I thought the CFP would would do that, but there was there's fear. And I remember talking to Bill Hancock, former director, about this. There was real fear that you'd be you'd be contorting the bracket and the seating to avoid potential rematches in the first round. That would unduly penalize other other teams and so i while i understand that um it would be great if if we avoided uh and maybe that doesn't have to be a protocol right or a policy maybe the committee members would just kind of do it and avoid the first round conference games yeah instead of a protocol maybe a preference that's not written in i'm with dan on this that i like it it do not break the bracket to avoid a rematch it would be nice if you can but but this the basketball it's easier to do because it's a bigger bracket you got more wiggle room more places to move people around this is a 12 team deal and i saw somebody said you know when this first came up the other day just you know can you just change us five to a six or you know to to 
avoid a 5, 12, 6, 11. No, because a five seed is a really significant seed in this bracket. It's an advantageous seed. And if somebody deserves the five seed, you give it to them as opposed to, well, we don't want them to have a rematch with somebody. Um, I just think the bracket is it's too small and there's too many barriers to, to fudging things around just to avoid two teams playing each other that happen to play in October. Yeah, I, I'm with I'm with the committee here and Hancock was right and and this is this this move is I, I just first off, Pat's correct. The five seed is gonna be unbelievable. You get the five seed, you're generally the next best team that didn't win the SEC or Big Ten. That by definition. You are the top team that didn't win. So you're probably a one loss team that only lost to the champion of the SEC or the Big Ten. And you would normally be ranked like third in the country. And your reward for that, which we should be rewarding, because we want the regular season to matter, which is why I want home more home field. I don't I'm not even getting in the clunky way that they're trying to figure out these neutral sites. Um is that'll just make your head spin. We can deal with that later. But you get to play the 12 seed as a five, which many years we believe will be the group of five champion and at home. And that is a, a good reward rather than as the six seed, you're playing number 11, which is going to be a power conference team most years and potentially like, look, Ohio state loses on Saturday by one point at Penn state, they could end up being an 11 seed. Would you rather play them as the six or would you rather play Boise State as the five, right? No offense to Boise State. I actually think Boise State is going to be a stronger pop, not group of five team than most years. I think this is a really good group of five team. But anyway, you win that, you then get to play as the five seed on a neutral site, the worst conference champion of the power four, whether that is generally speaking a big 12 team, a packed uh, I mean, an ACC team or like some upset team somehow. And that could be particularly true in one of these leagues where maybe, you know, somebody sneaks into the championship game with their conference championship game with two or three law two and back. So you're, you've got a very nice path to the semifinal. And so, but I think it's the perception that you're, you're doing anything but following protocol is what they want to avoid because all of a sudden everyone's going to start screaming, well, if you're doing that, you're favoring this team, you're favoring this league, and this committee is going to be under enormous issues trying to deal with it. And we're going to have our first rankings on Tuesday night are going to come out. Oh, and, God. Uh, yeah, the uh, ranking uh, show. Already? Yeah. Oh, God. And I've said on from the start, night. we've said it all the time, this is it. On election night, Great. we'll have some Perfect. real controversy here. Forget, I mean, this is important stuff, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have some real controversies. <laughs> oh, the fake ballots of, uh, of a of a uh, of top 25, it doesn't matter. I'm more interested. <laughs> but anyway, you get into this situation where you're going to undermine the credibility. They needed to get rid of the show. I know they're not going to do it because they got to prop up Maction or like some college basketball game in the middle of November. But your committee loses credibility every single week when they rank these teams and then have to explain it. And and they get into they they get they they don't follow the same plan each week and they come up with metrics and the poor the poor man or woman who's got to be the chair and, and get grilled every week on why someone's ranked 19th and not 24th and ball co game control and road turnover ratios and these things come up. It's really important that this committee has credibility and they will un start undermining it on Tuesday. And so uh, they need to have the best they can be to look like, hey, we just laid out our 12. If there's rematches, there's rematches. Look, did anyone hate Oregon and Washington playing a rematch last year in the Pac-12 championship game? Would anyone hate if, if uh, Penn State fans might hate it, but would anyone else hate it if Ohio State and Oregon played again in the Big Ten championship? Like rematches have happened; they they happen. Alabama and and Georgia in the SEC title game. Things have things have happened in the past. You deal with it. I I think you got to stick to the protocol. Yeah, for sure, and. Um... You're right. The 
the committee will begin absolutely just taking bullets voluntarily with this dumb plan for a dumb TV show while uh, laboring under the weight of Greg Sankey having said things need to go extremely well or incredibly well, i.e. <laughs> we're watching and we're ready to just take over this thing whenever we bloody well feel like it. So I uh, have always wondered why people actually volunteer to do this committee. Actually, they don't volunteer, they get paid. But and even more now, it's going to be, I think... How much you get paid to be on the committee? <laughs> they don't say. They never say. Say stipend or something like that, mm. they call it. But uh, Boy, I might now be interested. <laughs> you would be the worst committee member of all time. They would never let me no. out. I'd be great. No, you'd be terrible. I'd be great at this. You would be terrible. I'd skip three of them. Yes. <laughs> you'd skip three of them. Like, you guys work that out. I'll be at the hotel bar. Yeah, you'd lose interest halfway through on a couple others. No. <laughs> but anyway, this is no, this, I mean, Godspeed <laughs> to these people doing this committee. Ward Manuel is the uh, chair this year. So he's the guy that has to sit on front of the ESPN cameras and answer all the questions and uh, defend. You know, people just throwing stuff at a wall for several weeks. Imagine if he was the was chair a... last year and everyone would have been like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did Connor yeah. Stallions do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, uh, oh, um, man. over the off season, I don't know if it would be this off season or, or last year. I don't remember, but, uh, there was a thought, uh, there was a suggestion as we have said many times in the pod that they not do this. Right, that they not do the rankings until later in the season, maybe before the championship games and then after the championship games, the final, and that's it. And I had heard that ESPN was like, No, 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 no. We we need our we need our show and our millions of uh of viewers. So um here we are. You know, um we like to uh, often say in college athletics that uh, you, and you hear this a lot about the influence of TV and, and TV making a lot of decisions. And in this case, I think, you know, a reason that they, they do this unnecessarily is certainly for TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no other reason to do it. And it wastes these guys time uh, going down this many things. You could just do a zoom and, you know, do a practice one, but anyway, that's what they're doing. Um, listen, I, the, the the thing that I'm most can can the most I'm intrigued about that they will never do is just have a single computer formula as the guidance. And um then everyone knows what the computer formula is and you can follow along with it. Uh and I and I know that we hate math and college and computers and things like I mean it's college football, but not really. We'd rather have we got some guys here, no football. Like I don't really want people who know football. I want people who can analyze whether someone's like, let's say you're a guy, like let's say they invent the spread offense and you don't think that's football, right? There were a whole bunch of guys like that. This isn't football. Well, I watch, bring some old basketball coach in to watch the NBA now where all, if they figured out all you do is shoot three pointers, right? You go, well, that's in basketball. It's working for the Celtics. I don't know. They're playing. There's a ball in the coup hoops. I, I don't care what you think. Um, but in college hockey, they have a thing called pairwise, this computer formula that mimics the committee. They also have a committee. It's almost like you got a driverless car, but you put someone in there anyway. In case everything goes haywire and somehow the co just, just in case a four went four and 20 team gets now a little easier in hockey is more games. There's all this stuff. There's less teams, but it's funny that in they say Ward Manuel has a hockey team. Let's put it that way. A lot of the hockey, the same athletic departments that are like, eh, this works over here, but we ain't doing it over here. So I being on this committee, whew. I, well, there there's um there's a topic here we could spend a lot more time on, but it is the how the the selection committee in general and and why it it is a focus point for the Big Ten specifically, but but for Big Ten SEC. Big 12 and ACC, the, the power conferences on um, what the future, you know, is of the selection committee and how the teams 
are selected. I, I think that eventually we'll have a change there. Um, I just don't know what they'll change to. Will it be some kind of smaller committee? Will it be more based on uh, you know the multiple AQs that we've talked about a lot? There's a lot of people, I think, at that level, that power conference level, that want to uh, remove the subjectivity of a committee from this, or as much as they can. Still got to seat this. them, though. Yeah, like they, look you at, have to seat them, and you have is, to pick the at larges. Still, yeah. you're right. You know, but you yeah. you you limit their ability. You limit their ability if you if you do that. What do you, you know, like? I, just, I, I, we know we know ten of the teams. Ten of the teams are going to be set, and then maybe there's a debate over the last two two spots. There'll be like four teams going for it. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe not even that. It's a seating, but wait yeah. till they do home field all the way. Huh. Uh, no, the, the but seating. the thing that kills me is uh, the, the people that are concerned about the subjectivity of the committee are incredibly subjective themselves. They're incredibly self-interested <laughs> here. I mean, they, it's not like Greg Zanke and Tony Petiti are sitting there saying, let's do what's best for everyone. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> They're not. So, you know, I mean, I I haven't seen, I have have had some qualms with what the committee's done a couple of times. 2014 was pretty controversial. Last year was very controversial. I still felt like Florida State got a bad deal, but we saw a better playoff without them than with them. Um, But, like, this idea that they've somehow done a lousy job, I think, is false which I think is generally the case too with the basketball committees, but it's just these, it's an excuse to grab more control of this thing. It's, it's pointless control. It's, it's, you're it grabbing is. control over something you already have control over. Yeah. It's yeah. You know, it, it, someone's got to make a call at the end. Someone's got to make a call. And like I said, last year, I think we were kind of in agreement. FSU deserved to be in that playoff. I do not like a committee that says we don't like your second string quarterback especially when they once put Ohio State in because they said, we like your third string (laughs) quarterback. Like, what are we doing here? But at the same time, I was like, yeah, give me Michigan, Alabama. And that thing turned out to be every bit the game that we wanted. So, you know, it's a tough call. I Uh, I, I go back to, I've said this a lot on the show before, like I think it was 2018 or 2019. I did the mock selection thing in Dallas. Um, and I remember walking, you know, and you you sit in the same seats as the selection committee, the same room. You do the same things. You look at the same data. You do the same comparisons on the big screen. Um, and you get into the weeds on on seating based on these odd statistics, like the game control thing and all that stuff. And I remember leaving that room thinking, what in the F are we doing? It just – it was just – but just the the – the process of determining the teams and the seeding, get, getting into the weeds on these, you know, silly kind of statistics just is absurd to me. So there's some way that we could limit that. I am for it. But, um, you know, I, and I look at the models of, of the NFL and of any of other pro sports um, where you, you it is literally determined and slotted from what happens on the field. And I wish we could get something like that. The problem is college sports just isn't set up like that, you know, and it, it just, it's hard to do. Ross, you went to Pitt uh, this week. See our uh, friend, Coach Narduzzi, Pat Narduzzi, always got something to say. And um, <laughs> yes, he does. We, uh, we like Coach Narduzzi. I'm glad he's winning because I was a little nervous we might lose him as a head coach there after last year. Um, they play SMU this week. They're seven and zero, man. They're seven and zero, uh, and one of the it's. I think it's like Indiana overshadowed Pitt. It's just like here yeah. they are. Um, two great, really good wins over really dramatic wins over West Virginia and Cincinnati and all that. They haven't been as dominant, I guess, on the scoreboard as Indiana, but Pitt seven and zero. They're playing SMU. Huge game in the ACC this weekend, and uh, gave gave you uh, a one great quit uh, quote. And uh, and a great concept. Uh, after they won three games last year, he said, uh, this quote is great. I said, uh, blank, I have to clean house. So he fired almost everyone, including our guy, Tim Salem, who's the <laughs> famously the tight ends coach there. He's now 
coaching special teams, I think, at Georgia Tech this week. Is that right? Is yeah, he, he just got that... promoted like the special teams guy from from like an analyst position. For people who don't remember, Tim Salem was, uh, if... yeah, the guy that's so gung ho that he drinks flat Mountain Dew. He unscrews the caps to make sure they're flat because the bubbles slow him down drinking. So he wants the caffeine <laughs> to jolt as fast as possible. So that that's our guy, Tim Salem. I mean, <laughs> yes, he, does, he doesn't there are have other, time. There are other forms of caffeine no, these days. Not, Plenty of forms of caffeine where you don't have to <laughs> unscrew a top and let it sit there. <laughs> when we used to do our, uh, yeah, he had no time for carbonation, I think is what he said. Mm -hmm. He's too busy. Yeah. Doesn't have time yeah. for carbonation. He's coaching them Amazing. tight ends up. Yeah. We love Tim Salem, yep. and uh, we were a little, you know, that I was not happy with Coach Narduzzi for that move, but it's worked out for everybody, I guess. And the Mountain Dew uh, distributor down in Atlanta now, <laughs> poor guy in Pittsburgh, yeah. like, dang, I had kids in college, how am I going to pay for this? Yeah. So that's my best customer. Anyway, uh, they're 7-0. Oh. His other bit uh, was he said, I'm, I stopped paying the players. Yeah. Took the NIL instead of giving everyone some money. He said, uh, "You guys went. You guys won three games. You ain't worth it." And uh, the players, at least according to Pat Narduzzi, were like, "Yeah, you guys got a point." Um, what? <laughs> he yeah. wants hungry what players. A what, a, <laughs> I tell, what a time in college athletics, huh? <laughs> Did you imagine somebody reading this story like three years ago? I wish, like, I what wish in Jerry the world Tarkanian is going like. on. <laughs> I'm quoting a booster who's given $20 million to the football program, who's controlling player salaries and openly discussing it, and a coach who basically cut the salaries. It's crazy. <laughs> what Love a time. It. Where is Tark? Uh -huh. Where is Tark? My man, yeah, my friend yeah. Jerry Tarkanian would just, the what? I had to stop paying the players. <laughs> These quotes are just great. But uh, he got a yeah. hungry team. He, go. So he's like, screw yeah. it. We're not going to win yeah. these NIL battles anyway. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've kind of always wondered how that would work, and it's it, it seems to be working. Yeah, you know, Dan, um, we're in this time of transformation with, with athlete compensation and, and the whole industry. And I think it's fascinating to learn how different schools and different coaches are approaching it. Um, and it will be a different approach. It will change next year with the revenue share, I'm sure. all A lot of this would change. But for right now, it's been fascinating to see the approaches uh, in, in Pat Narduzzi has a very different approach. Um, while many schools are, you know, uh, kind of breaking the bank, so to speak, to keep players from leaving um, uh, and to pay to pay players to to stay to recruit players, um, you know, Narduzzi decided last year before the season to implement a tiering system where everybody got a little bit, you know, and he worked with the collective who Chris Bickle is the uh, big tech entrepreneur worth millions who kind of runs their collective and, and certainly gives a lot to it. And and so Chris and Pat decided last year, we're going to do this tiering system. Everybody's going to get a little cut, right? You know, I think there were like seven, six or seven tiers. And after last season, they decided, you know what, we're going to abandon this. And we're just, we're basically going to cut out all the all the NIL or most of it and we're just rewarding players who who earn it and, and a lot of those conversations will probably happen after this season going into next season there'll probably be an influx in NIL payments uh, uh but you know and I talked to a couple of players about this in fact one, one of the players when I when I began the question of how is this new structure NIL structure going the player said oh coach told you about that and i was like yeah yeah what so i was like what 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 I, you know what do you think about it and he said this is brandon george he's a 60-year linebacker there and he said i don't want to say that money had an impact on how we played last year in the three win season he's talking about but the attitude about money did and he really didn't want to talk any more about it but it is an interesting approach uh, that Narduzzi has taken. Now, there's been some other things, right, changes at Pitt. As you mentioned, Dan, he fired four of the five offensive staff members, including the coordinator last year. Virtually all of them replaced 
uh, replace them with um, a new offensive coordinator and a, a completely new staff. Offensive coordinator Cade Bell from um, Western Carolina came in, uh, and he brought play a few players with him, including Desmond Reed, who's having a great year, and in Eli Holstein, Holstein, Alabama quarterback. They got him out of the portal. Uh, last December as well. So other other things certainly have happened. And then the third thing, though, that has happened, Dan, is there's a bunch of players, specifically a few that were on defense after the season that came in and asked for more money while Narduzzi in the NIL collective director were kind of contemplating this move to scale back and, and pull the NIL. A lot of players were asking for more or didn't agree with this process. And Narduzzi quite literally opened the office door and said goodbye, and they left. Yeah, a couple of them to Colorado. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the pit coupon clippers, man. <laughs> well, it's fascinating, and clearly the position of the pod is not that NIL is the devil um, at all. It's a good thing. It should happen. But it's fascinating to go to some of these places that have – completely either counter-programmed it or just don't do it. Like I've been at West Point for the last couple of days where they are undefeated and having their best season probably since 1958. It's a completely foreign concept. They don't do any of that stuff. They get a salary, but what comes with the salary is cleaning a rifle and putting on a uniform and marching and all that sort of thing. That's where you, what you get paid for. You also play football and you do really demanding academic stuff. And, I, you know, there's certainly a satisfaction, I think, that, hey, you can do it another way. It's not saying that they're better than anybody else or smarter, but they don't have locker room issues. They don't have people sitting around saying, well, that guy's getting more than I'm getting, any of that stuff. Uh, it's fascinating culture. Really interesting to be around, as intense as any football program I have ever seen in my life. I mean, it, and I've been around Georgia, a little bit around Alabama, because you didn't get to be able to do that very much with uh, the Nick Saban days. But it is friggin' intense. And part of that is probably because they're playing Air Force since the Service Academy rivalry this week. But they are very serious about being good at football, and they are good, and it's pretty fun to watch. I think we always thought there were more ways to do this. It, it, it's not the the highest paid team isn't always going to do it. Right. Sometimes it happens. It certainly doesn't hurt. It, well, it doesn't hurt in acquiring talent, but I'm sure they gave Holstein something. They didn't get him for nothing. I yeah, mean, there are certainly players not, on the team that are getting right, yeah. getting something. Yeah. We're not. Let's not get too carried away here. But uh, you know, you figure out what works for you. And then you say, okay, like, this is why I think there's so much, the whole bit where they're going to Congress is always what's bothered me and try to rewrite the, the rules of the United States and, 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 re, and get some kind of, we don't do Sherman antitrust. Well, it's like, well, we'll never, we, we can't win a bidding war with Georgia. Well, you haven't beat Georgia in 40 years, bro. Like, let's not worry. You can still have a really good football program and a really good time. We don't need to, like, redo the the, the federal government because of that. It's a, the, the overreaction and the, and the desire for control. Find a different way. It's funny. Paying everyone less or, 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 or resourcing it out, and they got a better team. I mean, it's a great season for Pitt. Now, on the flip on this, a lot of – Buzz about the number one recruit in the country, class of 2025, Bryce Underwood, quarterback from Belleville, Michigan. He has been an LSU commit since January, where he was, you know, all the talk was this was a significant NIL package he was going to get. You hear three million, things like that. Uh, oh, it's it's rising. Michigan is making this massive push to get Bryce Underwood. Belleville is not very far from the Ann Arbor campus. I'm sure there are others involved also. I don't think anyone else has ever, you know, is a number one player until he's on your campus. It ain't over. Michigan, Harbaugh would not kind of go in like this. Michigan will and their boosters after having tasted <laughs> 15 and 0 and tasted 4 and 4 are, uh, I think they're four. Are they four and three? What are they? Five and three. Four and right? four. Five, I, I think know. they're five and three. Five and three. 
But it's a bad Tasting five and five three, and three. Let's be honest. It's a it's a tough five and three. Uh, they're pointing it up. It's not just Dave Portnoy. Michigan's got a lot of money. Bidding war up to five million. Uh, Michigan just had its its four star co- quarterback commit, uh, decommit uh, kid out of Florida. He's he's bailing. So I think you know there's a lot of smoke that they're going to be able to flip Bryce Underwood. But uh, here are these two. I love. I just love the concept of like two rich fan bases just throwing piles of money at some random like family. It's not <laughs> random, but right. I, I just. Like just yeah, four million, five million, like it was a racehorse or something. I, I mean, it's just crazy, <laughs> right? Um, but bidding's going up, so that's the other way. And I think that's the part that I, I I fear that that this is the type of stuff that scares college football fans. Oh my God, Michigan's just buying a quarterback. Um, I I don't know. What what do you think? Yeah, Pat? I mean, it's that's going to be the way of the world. And frankly, as we've talked about. That was often the way of the world behind the scenes and under the table um, yeah. back in the day. You know, Cam Newton, we, we don't have to go back there, but and he, he was worth the money. Not all of them are. I mean, good Lord, we could write, we could do a whole show naming off the basketball players that were paid a ton who never turned out to be very good. But uh, does Michigan need a quarterback? Geez, I, I hadn't noticed that they were struggling at that position. So... You know, it might be a, a fairly urgent situation for them, although throwing a kid in right away next year as a true freshman might also be asking for trouble. But, um, they, yeah, this is going to happen, especially with quarterbacks. Uh, if you are clearly established as a top one, two, three, four, five kind of guy, um, it's a buyer's market. So I think that people will be out there working to, to be the, the top bid. I'm hesitant to uh, believe a whole lot of the numbers out there. Um, and I say that because I, we've all had experience the last three years in NIL and the numbers. Um, I go back to the quote, I think, like uh, last December from um, Cooper Manning to me about some of the numbers. That I, you know, And he was revealing to me that these NIL numbers you hear out there like, – I, I know the real numbers are awesome. They're not the numbers that are out there. Like th- those are inflated. And so, and I'm not saying a bidding war is not happening, uh, but I, I, I think it, I think it odd that specific numbers are getting out. And, and I think, uh, I, and I just, I, I don't know. I just, I'm hesitant to, to believe a lot of it. And I, I wonder how the fact that the numbers are public uh, is helping a certain side. You know what I mean? Like th- this is this, there's a negotiating in public going on. It appears, uh, and so I'm always like, ah, oh, okay, is this real? And I don't know, Dan. You're obviously a little more plugged in with the Michigan side and all that. So I'm sure this is happening. I, I'm not doubting that. I just kind of like I'm curious in the future rev share model when you're going to be having these offers to players, these payment offers. I, I wonder um, how much things will be made public in an effort to impact the negotiations. Well, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Michigan booster, uh, but I know Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> the hell I'm giving money. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry, Bryce. I've seen you play. Excellent player. This kid's good. Um, I I'm not an LSU booster either, but I know boosters at both schools. I think the problem with when it gets out there is because they have to go they have to go to so many boosters and say we're ponying up we're going to make a five million dollar offer and that's how the, mm-hmm. the the interest i don't i have no idea how much they're actually bidding the paying the kid well, it shouldn't be going to boosters anymore well but I mean, it always will I, I know it because always will right? be d- it always will in a way i, I get that but that's why that. it's out but there. like it yeah, shouldn't but, with like but the there should be an owner world. right yeah. like a yeah i mean that's you know, why. That's I mean, why this are, stuff leaks out because it's not one guy yeah. saying, "I'll write the five million. It's right. they got they got their collective. So there's a lot of leaks, a lot of places for it to leak. Is it five million? Is yep. I don't really care. I, I don't think the yeah. Underwoods do either. I think at some point it's like, well, you get enough, and uh, we see this in free agency and pro sports. I've always been saying this for right. years. They don't always pick the guy who offers the most. 
It's like, well, we're comfortable here. We like this team. We like, like, if you're you're going to make three million, four million, or five million, or ten million, you know, maybe there's a number. I think there's two things. One is that great for the player? No, because everyone's going to be like, "Hey, man, this guy's worth not only you not five star. You carry that that hype. Not only the number one player, but someone's paying like you're a five million dollar guy at eight million dollars. Like that's a lot of pressure on a kid. Um, but I do think it says to this, and and eventually this is gonna this is gonna happen. The players are gonna make more than the coach. I, this is not a five million per year thing, but nobody blinks at the idea that Patrick Mahomes makes probably you know what's he making fifty million, and and Andy Reid's making he, he Andy Reid might be making ten. Nobody blinks at that because you go well we can get another Andy Reid. He's now that's kind of the extreme because he's a hell of a coach, but players make it's harder to find Patrick Mahomes than it is to find an Andy Reid, and. It's a lot harder to find Bryce Underwood than it is to find a Sharon Moore. And so at some point, when does this flip? And in the past, all the money has gone one side. And it's been like, oh, pay the coach 10, 12, 14 million, pay the defensive coordinator, this, that. And you go, okay, they got all that stuff at Michigan right now. What they don't have is a guy who completed a pass 20 yards downfield. It's flipping, right? It's flipping. We're we're seeing that happen. We're in the trans- transition of it, of it flipping. And I, I do wonder. I think we we discussed this uh, a while back about quarterback pay, and uh, you know if if teams are given what I've what I've heard uh, in the ref share era, football teams uh, football rosters in between fourteen and seventeen million for a football roster based on the first year ref share numbers. Uh, how much of that? Well, you spend on your quarterback, uh, and in you know the numbers that that are discussed out there, the high end for a quarterback is is in the low to mid seven figures, and you know if if the rev share number is set, you know so let's just say fifteen million for a football roster, well that's around ten percent for one player. Is, is that what's going to happen? Is that um, is that a good path to take? Is that where is that where this is going? If these numbers for Bryce Underwood are accurate, they're they're projecting eight to ten to twelve percent of their revenue share for their football roster to be spent um, on on a quarterback. Well, the the football industry has tended to over overvalue quarterbacks because when you get the, when you get Patrick Mahomes, it changes everything. You know, that's that's why. But, I mean, there were, what, six quarterbacks taken in the first 15 picks or something in the draft last year? It's not six of – there's not six stars out of that group. There may end up being three, but there's not six. But that's the – that's what everybody feels like you need to do to get a quarterback. Uh, a couple of things on this as well – in terms of the numbers and maybe the folklore or exaggeration that goes with it, the Washington Post did a deep dive on trying to get NIL numbers from as many places as possible and showing exactly how hard it is to get good information. But one of the things that came out of that series of stories, yeah, yeah, incredibly hard. But one of the things that came out of that series of stories is, oh, people aren't making quite as much as you might think. You know, the the mythology or the hysteria that, oh, my God, there's just a bunch of these spoiled, rich, pampered athletes running around campus. Eh, not really. Not really a lot of them. So uh, there's that. And the other part of it is if you're going to pay, Dan, to your point, you're going to pay the, your, your $5 million quarterback and the pressure that comes along with that and the expectation, who was the top quarterback recruit of 2024 is Dylan Rayola. He's playing pretty well right now, but he was thrown right into the fire. Worth it. Probably so, but right now he's the number 11 passer in the Big Ten on a 5-3 and three team. Okay? I mean, we'll see if next year, the year after, whatever, he turns Nebraska into a Big Ten championship contender or a playoff team. But they're neither now, and, you know, he's taking some lumps. I mean, I'm sure he has the potential to be worth it. But right now, he's just another quarterback in the Big Ten, really kind of below average. Patrick Mahomes is getting 14.49% of the Chiefs cap this year. 
Good for him. Mm. So whatever that means. Speaking of Mahomes, his teammate, our rival podcast, the New Heights, we're very close in <laughs> listenership. <laughs> Travis and Jason Kelsey were named People Magazine's sexiest podcast hosts. Mm. Hmm. What the hell, people? <laughs> we're right they, here. They tuned in. I know. <laughs> they must not be watching our video to see how handsome we are. YouTube. We yeah. have the YouTube channel. Yeah. I mean, what the hell, man? Just because tra- none of us are dating Taylor Swift. <laughs> We never met her. Who Speak knows? Speak for yourself, Dan. Yeah, that's true. She, Taylor Swift meets Ross. You yeah. don't know what is going to happen. Yeah. She's got that South Mississippi voice. Goodbye, number 87. You're out. Yeah. We don't know. Jeez. Terrible. Terrible situation. All right. We'll be back uh, with some intriguing games. All right, let's do some intriguing games this weekend. Now, we're going to pick uh, five later, but uh, we will uh, pick up the ones that we also find. Sometimes they're some secret games that only we think is intriguing. But, Pat, you, are you intrigued? Anything intriguing you out there? Many things intrigue me, many, many. But uh, I'll start with uh team we've talked a lot about this year, Indiana at Michigan State. Curtis Rourke is expected back they think after having thumb surgery and missing one game pretty quick turnaround there um i did something the 40 yard dash on all the nemesis games this week where your good team mostly good teams are playing teams that have dominated them and this is one where indiana's playing michigan state michigan state has won 12 of the last 15 in the big 10 east there was the hierarchy at the top, but kind of the hierarchy in the middle to bottom, too. And Michigan State was almost always ahead of the Hoosiers. This time, the Hoosiers have the better team. Again, they have not trailed all season. At some point in time, they're going to end up behind in a game. How are they going to handle it? How well can Rourke play? Is he worried about getting the thumb hit? Um, I think there's going to be a, a really interesting game. I don't think Michigan State can beat them. But I, I just want to see how Indiana reacts to the situation there in East Lansing. We talk a lot about elimination, you know, playoff elimination games, and and there are a couple uh, that I want to get to for for a couple teams. Um, Minnesota travels to Illinois. Uh, you know, is Illinois a playoff team? They're, they're six and two. Um, you know, if you look at their schedule, uh, they do they do um, if they you know they do have a. a, a uh, a decent schedule on the way on the way out here that they could you know win win the rest and, and go 10 and 2 but this is you know a game they they can't lose you know uh, they they need to win this one so from here on out you know Illinois got to got to continue to win to to get in and and, and Minnesota's played well especially lately so this is a big game for Illinois. I think the other one, the other eliminator I look at is is Ole Miss going to Arkansas. You know, Ole Miss six and two. Can they? They really can't afford a loss either. Um, and and they're going to be playing in a, a tough tough place to play. And the Razorbacks have shown flashes this year. So can can Ole Miss and can Illinois? Uh, can they um, can they win these eliminator games and and kind of. Um, remain in the conversation for for an at-large berth going forward yeah it's a uh not it's a somewhat sparse weekend um of of games so gotta get intrigued uh i am gonna go with duke visiting miami and duke's coming off a tough loss they're probably eliminated from the playoff but still you got manny diaz going back to a program he used to lead in Miami. Now he's the Duke head coach. Uh, Miami is 8-0, but has flirted with disaster at plenty of times this year. As as uh, It's exciting in Miami. They keep it exciting. Um, Miami should win, I think. But uh, you wonder, coming off the big Florida State victory, which obviously was not as more emotion because it's an in-state rivalry and all that, where are the Canes? Uh, Duke's a tricky team. So her, Miami is on pace for the playoff. There's a lot there, a lot happening. They're talking. They own the state. They they've got they got their chest puffed out. Um, beware of the Blue Devils. Beware of the Blue Devils on that. Pat. Um, another nemesis game. Louisville at Clemson. Louisville's been in the league for a decade and has never beaten the Tigers. I think they're zero and eight 
against them. They've had a couple close calls. They've had a couple of beatdowns. Uh, I don't know whether they're good enough in this situation because Clemson has been on a tear, as we've talked about quite a bit. But uh, Louisville, Jeff Brom, has pulled a few upsets in his time. They're a 10.5-point dog, which is pretty much, but it's in Death Valley uh, Saturday night. Want to see if Clemson can keep it rolling or if Louisville can throw a big old monkey wrench into the ACC race. How about the uh, Texas A&M Aggies leading the SEC heading to Columbia, South Carolina? Um, in, in, in heading there with, um, I don't know, quarterback controversy, right? Have they? Did he announce yet uh, a starting quarterback? I haven't seen. Um, did you guys see if Marcel Reed will start I, uh, or, I or Wegman? I have not seen anything declared. I, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, I'm guessing he's going to wait to the last minute uh, like these coaches often do. But it's fascinating what um, the Aggies have been doing. They're obviously atop the SEC, control their destiny into winning the SEC championship, getting into the playoff. Um, as we talked about last week, I think finally uh, following, uh, backing up uh, all the all the cash and resources that they have there. Um, and so this is a big one. It, it's a night game. Uh, at Williams Bryce, which is a, a tough place to play, they are loud there. They get pretty wild there. And South Carolina is in a position where, you know, at four and three, they they really need to win um, as well. It's a big year for Shane Shane Beamer and athletic director change there going on in the in the process of it. So big one for the for for both of these programs, but um, especially for Texas A and M to remain atop the SEC. Can they get it done? And do we see who do we see a quarterback? You know, do we see? Uh, both play. Do we see Marcel Reed? He, he certainly seemed to, to me, have, have won the job against LSU, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Um, all right. So we'll pick five games in a minute. I had a couple things we got to clear up. Um, big result this week the annual Iowa Best Tasting Municipal Water competition came out. Huge. And uh, our guys have won. Ames, you're back. Hooray. Took down Keokuk. Keokuk had stepped in and won a couple years in a row. Left us with plenty of reason to make fun of uh, Iowa State for her, and by proxy Ames or Ames, and then Iowa State by proxy for their big song saying they got the best tasting water around, which is not was not the case. But they're back. They won the best tasting water in Iowa, also the People's Choice Award. At the annual conference in Coralville, <laughs> boy, that's that's got to be one. We missed wildness. out on that, didn't we? Yeah, we missed out on that one. I mean, I I, I, I cover a lot of conferences. They should have put that on the list too. Sure, I got to go to what Coralville a for the, the water, water, that water one is. chorus. Yeah, uh, look, you Does can't anyone keep there down. drink anything but water. I would hope so. <laughs> like at the, do they have a cocktail party where they just drink water? <laughs> There's water in everything, Dan. Water and beer, water and booze. I know, Come but on. like if you're at the water yeah. convention. Yeah. <laughs> I would hope you drink everything but the, water. The, the pool, spiked water, Dan. The, yeah. The, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Coralville, uh, you know, gentlemen's club must just be out of control that weekend. <laughs> what a party weekend that is. That, But you look, you can't keep the, Ames down. <laughs> you cannot keep Ames down. They will. They will come back in the water race. I'm glad they've they've returned to the top. Well, our hero John Dunn, the Water and Pollution Control Director of Ames, we feel Ames water is entirely deserving of the attention. Ames residents have embraced and celebrated our great water for decades. We feel tremendous pride in producing such valued commodity. <laughs> there you go. Take that fifth time winning since mm -hmm. 2011. Uh. Ames will now enter the national competition next summer in Denver. Ooh, I'm going. Oh, I didn't know oh, about wow. this. I'm going. I'm going to cover it. <laughs> expense, expense. I told to you Denver. once I was in Kentucky. I was in Lexington, Kentucky, covering something at UK, and the my hotel was one the one right by Rupp Arena there. The yeah. whatever was Hyatt. attached. Hyatt. The Hyatt. It was. I got in the elevator and they they were having the Kentucky Morticians con conference, and everyone had their little badge, and I was like, "Oh my god, the Morticians are going to take over the lobby bar." <laughs> <laughs> the stories you would hear. Oh god, 
not the most weird lively. crew. Uh, but I'm bump. You never know. You get a couple pops in those guys. <laughs> I want to know what the water convention people do. Oh. Uh. <laughs> uh finally one more uh just an update we had the cocaine pizza in Dusseldorf. Yeah. people really seem to mm, like that one they did yeah number 40 yeah don't order the number 40 you'll get a bag of coke and a visit from the german police <laughs> on the side of your pizza you can hear that whole story uh well guess what uh america not backing down um some guy in a wisconsin operating the famous Yeti's Pizza in Stoughton, Wisconsin, about 20 miles southeast of Madison. Uh, he ran out of oil while making his pizzas. So he went to an industrial... This is in the New York freaking Times. This is how big this story was. He went to an industrial kitchen nearby, shared by multiple business, and took some oil that belonged to a different business. Well, guess what? It was cannabis oil. Uh-oh. Oh, God. Whoops. He put cannabis oil uh, on some of the pies, <laughs> leading mm. uh, he d the, quote, operator did not notice the label on the cap. Uh, likely story. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, and uh, the the customers of famous Yetis had a reaction, let's just say. <laughs> Yeah. Unexpected physical symptoms after eating the mm -hmm. pizza, according to the police statement. <laughs> they wanted another pizza. But that not was painful reaction. symptoms. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, not, yeah, that's right. I'm still that's got right. the munchies. I have a whole pie. <laughs> Dude, what is going on in pizza? They, they're losing their marbles. They're, they're doing blowover in Germany. They're getting stoned in Wisconsin. I'm scared. Yeah. What's the next drug I mean, we can... Uh, we can put on a pizza. When they Golly. say hot and ready, I don't know what's coming next. Mm, no, I know. <laughs> Sprinkle any meth on there, huh? Jeez. <laughs> don't give them any ideas. Yeah. Mushrooms, the psychedelic kind. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. All right. Maybe we need our own pizza place. Anyway, be careful with your pizza. Dude in Wisconsin. Come on. He knew what he was putting on there. Uh, all right. We'll be back. Race for the case. I'm in the lead. Joe says I'm tied for the lead. I think I'm in the lead. Tied. 31, 22, and 1. Joe and I looking good. Pat, 27, 26, and 1. Ross, 25, 27, and 2. Mm. So there's our standings. Uh, let's pick them, though. Number three, Ohio State giving three and a half in Happy Valley. Penn State, number four. Both will be there. High noon, Saturday. Pat? Uh, I've seen this movie before. It ends the same way every time. Penn State comes in with hope and promise and leaves with an L. Uh, and I think it'll be an L slightly larger than three and a half points. So I'm going to take the Buckeyes, who have better talent, even if they have not put it all together with great regularity. I think this is time to do it. And I see Ohio State winning and covering. Uh, you know, Ohio State's... Um... Won seven straight, I think. Uh, won 15 of 18 in the series. Maybe 11 of 12. Um, Nine of 10. So I get... 11 huh? 12, yeah, maybe. yeah, 11 of 12, maybe. I yeah. don't know. So um, I get uh, the doubt in that, in that Penn State can do this. Uh, and I don't know that they'll do it, but I think they'll certainly stay close enough to cover the three and a half, the Nittany Lions will. Ohio State's often, uh, offensive line has struggled enough and now is without two players, um, and they're having to shuffle about the line. Um, that I think it's enough for the Nittany Lions to either win outright or at least stay within a field goal. I feel like I'm definitely going to regret doing this because of what you mentioned, Pat. James Franklin – seems to not be able to get over these big opponents. But one thing really stands out to me for this matchup, Abdul Carter has been phenomenal. He might be playing himself into the first defensive player drafted in the upcoming draft for how well he's transitioned from linebacker to defensive end. Right now, Ohio State's dealing with a lot of injuries on their offensive line. They're down two left tackles. I'm kind of banking on that being enough for Penn State to get home, to get a turnover, a big sack, whatever it is, at home with all that energy. But as I said, I'm sure that I'm probably going to regret this. I'm going to take Penn State to cover. 
This is a guy saying I'm re- going to regret picking Penn State at, 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 at four days after he ate 60 buffalo. I didn't regret that. That was I know. A, that no was regret. A... That's how scared you are <laughs> to pick Penn State. <laughs> exactly. You sat down and said, I'll have 60 boneless chicken wings, which are just chicken nuggets, sauce nuggets, at Applebee's of all places, with no fear. And yet you're afraid. You're regretting. You're stating your regret. I will have no regret. I'm picking the Buckeyes. I think they wake up. I think they play really well in this game. Uh, offensive line concerns me. Tyler Warren from Penn State just <laughs> concerns me, as he should. Better concern Jim Knowles' defense, but uh, I like the Buckeyes here. I they got a better. They got all the. They got so much talent, and I think this is the this is the one they get. They get. They get it going on. Uh, so I'll take that. No, no fear. O H. Number 10, Texas A&M, given two and a half at South Carolina, 7.30 p.m., ABC. Ross, you discussed the game earlier. Who do you pick in? Yeah, yeah. Of course, I didn't follow the rules and That's discuss right. the game. That would there really aren't that many typical, intriguing games this week. T- typical, typical me. Uh, yeah, we, we, we talked about, um, you know, I, I was doing some Googling uh, mm-hmm. while we were talking um, and yeah, Mike Elko has not announced as of Thursday morning a uh, a starter, um, either Marcel Reed or Connor Wegman. So we don't know yet. Um, I I don't know that it will matter. Uh, I think A and M goes in there into a, a hostile environment at night and and pulls out a win, a close one, but enough to cover the two and a half. And the Aggies remain atop of the league. Uh, I'm going to take South Carolina here, upset special. Shane Beamer's another guy who is good in some underdog spots, and this one I think sets up well for his team. I would be shocked if Marcel Reed isn't the starter, but we'll see. Um, I A and M is a, a very good team, having a very good season, but I just don't see them being on a level where they're going to be rolling into the season-ending game against Texas. Uh, 10 and one and undefeated in the sec so they're going to trip up somewhere and this is it game cox pat just wants the opportunity to say lone cock again i'm, I'm fearing mm. that i'm hoping that mm. uh, somebody else picks south carolina here it's not going to be me though one thing that's very important to note in this matchup i, I know that this is tough road environment at night for texas a&m to deal with South Carolina's offensive line is statistically one of the worst in the country. They have done a terrible job of getting pushed on the line of scrimmage, running the ball. They've averaged pretty good rushing totals per game, but they don't get consistent push. Uh, they also are very bad at protecting Lenora Sellers. We saw so far over the past few games for Texas A&M that they dominated against a bad Missouri offensive line. They got pressures against the best offensive line in the country, possibly in LSU. And then now you get this situation where you can feast again. I'm a little wary of if Marcel Reed starts, if he's able to have success, because we know that South Carolina's front seven and their run defense is so good. But I'm going to take AM. They've got all the momentum. Uh, unless they completely falter and fall for this trap, I think they're going to be able to do it. There will be no lone cock. Ooh. Mm. I'm going cock commanders as well. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Pat. Um, no, that's fine. Join me with the cocks. Come on. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, at a certain point i wonder like do i have to like bleep this do i have to am i gonna get yelled at? i didn't name we don't we didn't name the team we didn't name the team exactly yeah, this is what south uh, carolina calls did, they, did the university of south carolina call you did they say what would what should we name the team didn't they say did that not. to me i was not consulted not so my fault we're just going with what they gave us we we the, who is the we did extensive reporting on that on the whole controversy oh. over who was the real <laughs> chicken or yes. whatever i can't oh yeah remember that thing oh that was great yeah listen yo soy el cock commander this is the hangover special of all time texas a&m's coming off this massive win everyone's excited big emotional saturday night game and now you got to travel to South Carolina. South Carolina is coming off a bye. They're going to get now now the targets on AM. You're going to give me a couple points, two and a half. I'll take it. 
I don't know what will happen. I like Texas A&M, but I, I'm kind of with Pat. This is this is a hard game. If if Texas A&M wins this game, this will be far more impressive than just beating a whatever South Carolina is, whatever their record is, four and four, something like that. I don't know. Because this is not easy to. This is a trap hangover game of all of that that you get. Uh, it's just too hard to 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 do. So if they can they can have the focus to win this game on the road, you got you're coming off the hangover. You got a hangover from the last game, and it's very loud in Williams Bryce, and uh, it's not a good place for a hangover. So, um, although generations of Cock Commander fans have 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 persevered uh, through that, so I'm taking a and I mean, I'm taking South Carolina. Uh, number eighteen Pitt at number twenty SMU. SMU giving seven and a half massive ACC tilt in Dallas. 8 p.m. on the ACC network. I guess they didn't, they weren't planning on this one being a big one. Uh, back to Pat. Yeah, back to Pat. Yeah. Um, I will say one of the disappointing things about this week, there are no kickoffs after 8 p.m. We don't get the, you know. Yeah midnight to 1 a.m 2 a.m window of insanity so get your insanity where you can and i think this will be a this should be a good entertaining game the point spreads too much i wonder if that's based on the uncertainty about eli holstein and according to pat narduzzi he's gonna be okay he's gonna play i'll trust that he's telling the truth on that and I will take Pitt in the points there. SMU's a good team. This, I mean, this is going to be a good matchup, and I think there's going to be a lot of points on the board. But I am rolling with the Panthers here to certainly keep it within seven and a half. I like that hook. Give me Pitt to cover. Same. And I was at Pitt practice on Tuesday, and uh, Eli Holstein was running around just fine. Um, so I, I, I spoke to him after practice, so I think he's going to be fine in, in play and, and, uh, I don't know that, uh, Pitt will win, but it certainly will stay inside of a touchdown. This seems like a, this seems like a really big number. Give me Pitt. I really like the number as well with that hook at seven and a half. And also it, we've watched both these teams. They're both really good. I don't think SMU is more than a touchdown better than Pitt. Understandably, the quarterback situation that you've brought in here could complicate things. But plain and simple, both these squads have gutted out close victories uh, against lesser opponents. They've played messy games. I don't think SMU is heads above Pitt. If Pitt plays as well as they did defensively last week, and certainly the turnovers were a big factor in it, probably not going to have five interceptions like they did against Kyle McCord in Syracuse. But Pitt defensively, I think, is strong enough could disrupt Kevin Jennings just a little bit enough to keep this thing within range. They could certainly possibly win it as well, but I think for sure that seven and a half is doable. Yeah, I'm taking Pitt. Uh, the, the seven and a half, I like that little, get that half. Too many points, uh, much of what, I'm not going to repeat everything just said, but uh, I'll take the Panthers. Uh, cocktail party. You see they announced the future sites for two years of the cocktail party while Jacksonville Stadium gets redone again. They're going to play one in Atlanta, one in Tampa. I guess Athens and uh, Gainesville not available. I'd rather they just play these yep. things on campus, but hey. Mm -hmm. Georgia given 16 and a half. Florida uh, against number two, Georgia, 16 and a half. 330 on ABC. Ross? Whew. Big spread. A lot of points. Um, I understand why. Uh, I, I know the trajectory of these two programs, but it's too many. It's too many points for me. And, and Florida's been playing better. Probably should have beat Tennessee. Certainly rolled over Kentucky. And a uh, huge pressure game for for Billy Napier. Um, and I think they play well. Not well enough to win, though, by maybe, but certainly well enough to stay within sixteen and a half. So, give me the Gators. I'm with you there. Florida has definitely turned. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on Florida. They have uh, turned a bit of a corner, more competitive all the way around. I'm a little concerned. I mean, I'm scared that, you know, to this could easily end up like 43 to 10 for Georgia. But it's a, it is a rivalry game. They've had two weeks here to get DJ Lagway further up to speed. Freshman QB. 
So I think that the Gators are ready to at least make it a game. They may lose by 14. They may lose by 10. I don't see them winning, but I also don't see them losing by more than 16 and a half. So I'm taking Florida on the points. Florida's been better, but I can't put my faith in a true freshman quarterback going up against Georgia in this rivalry. I, I think that Georgia's the type of team that smells blood and they're starting to hit their stride as well. I think they can cover this. I think that in one or two turnovers from Lagway bust this thing wide open and that Georgia can cover that 16 and a half and win by 17 or more. Same, taking the dogs. Uh, Florida's without a wide receiver, without a cornerback. Um, I think late uh, Bulldogs pull away, so I will take Georgia in that one. Uh, finally, I uh, Wisconsin at Iowa. Iowa is giving three, 730 on NBC. There's also a really good game with Texas Tech visiting Iowa State. Big weekend in Iowa. They win the award. Iams gets the award. Uh, also, water-related news in Iowa. Kirk Ferentz revealed he was thinking about how good his punter has been lately. You see this? <laughs> he said, I yes, was thinking yes. about it today while in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think about punters in the shower all the time, Dan. Uh, yeah. Kirk, the one Kirk, minute of the time, the Kirk. day, a head coach has really to he can just like toot it all out. Calgon, take me away, right? Mm -hmm. And what is Kirk Ferentz doing in his morning shower? He's thinking about his punter. He's thinking about punting. <laughs> Fantastic quote. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> the things you learn at the weekly press conferences are just you can't watch them all that's the problem there's too many it's just funny anyway good job coach uh anyway i was given three uh pat yeah i'm a little intrigued about the uh hawkeye quarterback situation brendan sullivan came off the bench and and sparked him a bit against northwestern um threw for 80 yards ran for 40 yards and a touchdown uh see where they go there but Wisconsin just hasn't been able to prove it consistently to me and Iowa always is consistent so I'm going to take the Hawkeyes lay the three and figure that they win on you know they'll win by a field goal plus a safety plus a couple coffin corner punts and there's more shower material for Kirk Ferentz Mm, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm also taking the Hawkeyes. Uh, you see, you guys see the over under uh, in this game for 40 and a half. Yeah, Good old man. fashioned Big Ten uh, over under. Give me, give me the the Hawkeyes in uh, uh, a fun defensive duel uh, to to cover the three. I wonder if the Brendan Sullivan performance was more revenge fueled so i'm i'm thinking here that wisconsin i really was impressed by the way that they played in the first half against penn state and then just got outlasted by them once prabula came into the game i think wisconsin can do this uh, iowa has been super i know that they've been the epitome of consistency but they've been up and down on offense i think wisconsin could pull this thing out and uh, and to cover the three at the, ver the bare minimum all right this is just this is a rough pick I uh, I'm gonna go with Iowa. They've been scoring. I think they'll score. I think they'll they'll be able to cover. I don't like. I wouldn't pick this game. I don't like the thirteen and a half no. that Cyclones are given either. That's a tough game, Texas Tech. I mean, that's a huge game. Mm -hmm. Iowa State yep. remain unbeaten. Stay in this thing. So Iowa's the place to be. Get out in that lake. The weather's been graded. Get your boat back out there. Just sit there and watch Cyclones and Hawkeyes all weekend. Don't even need to go to the games. I'll take uh, I'll take Iowa in this game, but it's tough. All right, uh, lock of the week. Who's got one? I got, I got one. one. All right, Ross. We all remember a few years ago when uh, – or last year. Was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. When Diego Pavia went to, uh, uh, went to Auburn and won um, – I don't know that the same thing happens, but Auburn is a touchdown favorite against Vanderbilt, which is a shocking spread. Um, and so I think Diego and the boys at least cover that. They'll give me the lock of the week as the boys from Vandy. And I don't know how often we've had a lock of the week from Vanderbilt, Dan, but here we are. 
<laughs> not this way. Vandy on the road. But that, hey, the Albuquerque Tinkler is yeah, done in I agree. Hugh Weird two spread. years in a row. He got him when uh, when he, when Few was at Liberty, and he got him when Hugh was at Auburn. So the, the Tinkler owns Hugh Freeze. My lock of the week, I, Dan already mentioned the game. I had this circle before we started. I love Duke getting 20 against Miami. Duke plays close games, and Miami tends not to blow out teams this year. They, they win, but they're not blowing people out in the ACC. So I will take the Blue Devils in 20 points, and Manny Diaz having his team absolutely breathing fire on his behalf in uh, South Florida. Give me, give me Duke. My lock this week, and this is going to sound like a crazy one, I'm taking Kentucky plus 16.5 versus Tennessee. I think what we've learned is that it's the margins in the SEC this year are a lot closer. I know that Kentucky's had a rough stretch recently. This could be a bounce-back opportunity. Tennessee has had inconsistent performances week in and week out, and it feels like they're not playing to the ability against weaker opponents. So I think that they're going to slow down here a bit. Kentucky, good defense, gets after Nico. They cover that 16 and a half. All right. I'm taking Kansas State, giving 13 and a half at Houston. Every man a Wildcat hits the road. I'm not, uh, uh, Houston's got three wins. They're coming off a nice win against Utah, but I think that says as much about Utah as Houston. This is a team that lost 42 to like 10 to Kansas. Got shut out by UC, got shut out by Iowa State. Uh, I think Kansas State is a methodical uh, team and will uh, will go in there and beat Houston by more two touchdowns or more uh, and move to eight and one. So I like the Kansas State there. Uh, all right. That's our, uh, that's our show. We'll be back on Sunday to overreact to it all. Uh, happy Halloween to those who observe. I don't know if everyone observed for Halloween. And uh, at least we didn't do one of those like gimmicky, which the best candy drafts. Oh. Mm. Yeah. What's like, your costume see, this those year? Those are terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that probably, you know, would help you win the People Magazine sexiest podcasters. But we're we're all about <laughs> substance here. We're all about substance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. We thank Joe because he's a producer who wouldn't come up with such a bad gimmick. That's right. Thank you, Joe. Good thank job, you. Joe. I support the cocaine on pizza. We're yeah, not we're doing any about. stupid we're... candy drafts, so I can support that. I love the Twix bar, man. <laughs> love the Twix bar. <laughs> Hell no. We want blow on our pizza. That's what we want. Let's go to Dusseldorf. Live show. <laughs> See you Sunday. Talk to you later.